Welcome to this video on the electric field part four. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the electric field as a vector field. Now, at the end of the last video, I left you with the challenge where I gave you these two different field maps and I asked you to figure out where was the strongest and the weakest location in these electric fields in each of these different images. Well, based on the idea that the density of the field lines defines the strength of the electric field, we're going to say that the electric field is strongest over here somewhere in this region and it's weakest somewhere out here. We can't say specifically, but we can say that it's further out here uh, where the field lines are less dense. Now in the image on the right, we would say that the field is definitely weakest right here because there aren't any lines. And so it's actually zero, not even just weak, it's completely zero. And then it's strongest somewhere around here on either side of these two charges. Now as a side note, which we'll talk about later on again, this is referred to as a dipole. So it's got two different poles, a source and a sink, both in the same vicinity. Now this is the thing that we're going to focus on for this video, is the idea that when I have at least two uh, source charges, I'm going to have an electric field that's due neither to an individual source charge, but due to both as a combination. Now the reason that we can show this um, weird kind of phenomenon that's happening in both these cases here is that we understand a term that is known as superposition. Now superposition, or sometimes referred to as interference, so put these both these terms here, are terms that basically are describing the overlap of waves. And in this case, we're not going to get into this in great detail right here, but these are electromagnetic waves. And for now, just kind of think of these terms as just meaning that the field from one source and the field from another source, they superposition or they interfere, uh, aka they overlap, and then they end up creating some net field that is the sum of both the individual fields. Now we have defined the electric field E as the amount of electrostatic force that is exerted per unit of charge um, at a specific location. And we showed that that is the same thing as writing 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q over R squared. Now we want to make sure that we have this very um, concretely defined in our minds because it will help us then to um, explain how the field results in this way. So basically all that I'm saying is, all right, if I pick a spot right here, there's nothing there, just a location, and if I were to put a charge right there, it would experience X amount of force per unit of charge that it was. So if I put more charge here, it experiences more force and so on. Now the alternate way of describing the field at that location is if you have a source charge, this guy right here, that source charge, the bigger it is, the stronger the field would be at that point. And R is the distance, right, or the position rather, right there, located at some distance from the center of that source. So basically, the vector describes the idea that you can have a, a magnitude of field strength, and you can also have an orientation of the field in any particular region. So if I come over here to this image that I have at the very bottom here, and select that, that would be as if, um, so just ignore the curvature here on the edges. We're mainly focused on, I just wanted to show you that if this were just its own charge by itself and there wasn't this other one here, that the field lines would still be pointing up. But when I bring the other positive charge in the vicinity, the field lines end up canceling out or superpositioning and summing to zero, which is very important. So what we want to do is um, always keep in mind that when we're defining the electric field, we're always defining it only for a specific position, not a region, although we can do that as well. For this video, we're defining just a specific position or distance r, right, this position right here at some distance from both of the charges, and we are defining the field only 
at that exact point. And so that's what we're going to take a look at now and see how do we actually come up with that idea. So what I'm going to do is, in order to best define these vectors, I'm going to go ahead and put a um, Cartesian plane on here. So we'll, we'll add an x and a y axis onto this one. And then I will do the same for this one at the top here. Okay, and I'm going to establish it so that 0, 0 falls pretty much right there in the middle. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this location, R, and figure out how we can show that the electric field has become zero. Well, pretend this, uh, well, let's name these really quick. Let's name this top one uh, Q1, and it makes an electric field defined E1. And this guy at the bottom here is Q2, and Q2 makes an electric field that's defined as E2. Now, if I uh, isolate Q2 by itself, so remember this over here, and I'll label the diagram as Q2, and this is E2, and I'm going to say that this 0, 0 location is going to go ahead and shift this up just so we can really hit this idea home here. Okay. I can say that Q is placed at maybe, you know, 0, negative 5, or whatever we want to call it. But that location right there, right now it's not 0. It has some, mag uh, some electric field at that point. And I can say, well, tell me right now, what is the orientation, or also known as the direction of the electric field at that point? Well, it's just whatever direction the arrow is pointing when it crosses that point. And we would say that that uh, traditionally, if we're going to use this label, is that, uh, oops, there should be an X, that the electric field is pointing in the positive Y direction at that exact location. So we would say, if we wanted to write that out, is that E2 is a positive value. So we just listed something like this. Now, obviously, that changed when I brought Q1 into the vicinity of Q2. It ended up deleting this in some way. And so that's what we're going to try to show so that we can um, show how the vector field is added. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll erase this whole bottom section here just so that we have some more space. Now keep in mind, we're only dealing with that one specific location. We're not writing an expression for the entire uh, field, just that specific location. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that at this point right here, I'm only going to focus in the y dimension right now. So we'll have the negative y dimension and the positive y, and we're going to ignore the x and we're going to ignore everything in between. So what I'm going to first show here is that at that point over here, so at the point 0, 0, the electric field due to Q1, which I call E1, that's going to be a negative value, right? Because it's pointing, if the other one wasn't there, it would be pointing straight down in the negative direction. So I'm going to make that a negative E1. And Due to Q2 over here, we just established that the electric field at that same point right there is a positive E value. And so I'm going to write plus and say this is positive E2. So I'm adding the two vectors together. Now I can see very clearly from this picture that there's no field there. It's not just weaker, it's actually completely deconstructed or completely um, canceled out and so this must sum to zero at that particular location. Now what I probably should do is I should probably put a Y subscript on here just to specify that I'm only talking about that up and down direction over there although the left to right directions of all of the individual ones would have canceled as well. Now I'm going to say to you that um, if I wanted to expand this to show the full equation all right, I'm going to go ahead and write that all in. So I'm going to do uh, negative 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times Q1 over, and I'm going to call this R1 squared. Now R1 squared is 
this direction or this uh, distance or position over there. Now I'm going to add the same thing over here, 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught times q2 over r2 squared. And I'm going to show that that is r2. And we can see that that is all going to sum to 0. Now I can obviously factor out the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, so I'll go ahead and do that and just, just to kind of clear out the the space here, so we have this negative q1 over r1 squared plus q2 over r2 squared, and that equals zero. Now, if I told you that um, q1 is the same as q2, then we know that e1 is the same at e2 only if r1 is the same distance as r2, which I did put that exactly in the middle. So if it's exactly in the middle and we know r1 is the same value as r2 and the q's are the same, then this would be like saying, let's for instance, negative 5 plus 5 and that equals 0. And so we can see here that this is just vector addition, right? We've, we've looked at an arrow and showed that the two vectors were pointing in opposite directions only at that specific point. Now if we picked a different location, then it wouldn't necessarily sum to zero. It might sum to something else. Now let's just, for the sake of it, uh, take a look at this one over here. And let's pick, uh, we'll put a, another coordinate plane over here. I'll go ahead and scoot that over as best I can. And we're going to deal with this point exactly here in the middle again. And I'm going to leave you with a challenge. And the challenge for this video will be to try to come up with, to show that the electric field here is not equal to zero. So show in some way, like I did over here, that the electric field does not equal zero, but is actually stronger in this region. And when we come back in the next video, we'll take a look at how to show that and solve.